Adams Tollway. Stop and go 59 to 53. Edens, 21 minutes Lake Hook to Montrose. Kennedy, an hour. O'Hare to downtown, 42 minutes from Montrose, 38 in the Express. Eisenhower, 57 minutes, 390 to downtown, 39 from Manhunt. Stevenson, an hour and 20 minutes, 355 to Lakeshore Drive. To Ryan, 37 minutes from 95. That's traffic. I'm Jim Talamonte on AM 560, The Answer. Chicago's Morning Answer continues next. In our one-hour heating and air conditioning weather center, we'll see partly sunny skies. High near 55, clear and 39 overnight. Currently 42 degrees at O'Hare. Next news coming up at 9. Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy continues next on AM 560, The Answer. This hourly segment is brought to you by Papa Nicholas Coffee. Papa Nicholas Coffee. Roasted fresh daily in Batavia, Illinois. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM 560, The Answer. Good morning. Uh, well, note here, I'd like to thank uh, Somrus. Somrus is this uh, spirits outfit. Yeah, and this Friday and Saturday, you can sample artesian chocolates, wines, and liqueurs and spirits from vendors like Somaris that make mango and chai rum creams. They're uh, pouring at the Chicago Wine and Spirits Expo, and uh, I am trying their uh, chai cream liqueur in my coffee this morning. And what do you think? Uh, It's helping me indulge (laughs) and endure the rhetoric coming from the Chicago Teachers Union. Uh So I appreciate that, uh, Samra, so well-timed with your delivery of these liqueurs. And real quick, the Chocolate Wine and Spirits Expo includes free parking in the West Loop and over 40 artisans with proceeds benefiting Chicago Canine Rescue. Secure your tickets today. Go to GourmetExpo.com, GourmetExpo.com. All right. Uh, Joshua Mitchell is a academic at Georgetown University, visiting fellow in American political thought, and he is the B. Ken Simon Center uh, uh, for Principles and Politics at the Heritage Foundation, a fellow there. Uh, he has written an interesting piece in National Affairs, na- uh, nationalaffairs.com, which I'll tweet out, Why Conservatives Struggle with Identity Politics. Why conservatives are so bad at confronting the identitarians that you saw on stage this week, those 12, the uh, AOC and other backbenching freshmen behind them, driving them really uh, further and deeper into identity politics. We're pleased to be welcome, uh, pleased to welcome Josh Mitchell to the show. Josh, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Dan. Glad to be here. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. And so you start out by uh, presenting sort of the two different definitions of identity. Uh, one rather innocuous, the one that's employed by the identitarians, less so. Yes. So uh, 30 years ago, those of us who remember, we would say, I'm an American, I'm a this, I'm a that. But now the word identity is everywhere we look. And if it just means, well, I'm an American, that's fine, except that I think what's happened is that identity now means something more. It's a relationship between those who are pure and those who are stained. And the name of the game in identity politics is to figure out how many purity points you have. And you set all this, you set your purity points against the one prime transgressor, which is the white male heterosexual. And I'll be clear, I'm not defending, you know, white identity. Trust me, that's not what I'm up to. What I'm saying is we have a sickness in America right now where the only thing that we're concerned about is how pure you are. And we saw this on the Democratic stage, everybody trying to out-pure each other. And my argument is what we should be doing instead is paying attention to building a world together. So I set up the contrast between the politics of innocence, which is what identity politics is all about, versus the politics of competence. And Americans are about competence and about building a world together, and that's where we need to go. What about the uh, victimizing themselves? Because everyone seems to <clears throat> try to garner votes by saying, well, I know what you're feeling because I, too, was, you know, what Elizabeth Warren said, was fired because I was pregnant which we know now that was yeah. not to be true. But do they? Do you think that they well, really so are scoring the, points with the American public by becoming a victim well, or painting themselves as a victim? 
I think that's the game they're playing. So, so my argument is that the Republicans were given a gift by Trump because he imploded the old Republican Party, and now we're in the process of rebuilding. The Democrats haven't figured out that identity politics among the mass of Americans is over, and Trump is going to win resoundingly because of this. The sick thing we have now in our country is that in order to be heard, we have to somehow have an innocence category. It's not about how competent we are. It's how innocent we are. And you simply cannot build a world if we're not concerned about competence. So we have to return to what I call the politics of competence. Uh, let me rewind for a minute. Uh, Trump uh, blew up the Republican Party, the old Republican Party. Uh, some Republicans want to go back to the uh, halcyon days of, uh, of a Mitt Romney and a John McCain and a compassionate conservative George W. Bush. Uh, uh, why was that a good thing and why can't we go back? Uh, I, so on my view, again, I'm old enough to remember what happened when Reagan took over the party in 1980. There, were, there was a group called the Rockefeller Republicans who thought, well, we'll put up with this guy for four years and then we'll take back our party. And it never happened. And, and my view is, while I have many, many friends who are neoconservatives and I'm actually, while, I'm, while I was affiliated with Heritage last year, I'm actually out in the Middle East right now. And I've been there off and on for 14 years helping to build universities. So I went to Iraq after the war. Hmm. Uh, and I, and I, so I, I know what's there. I look it up. I was the cha- chancellor of the American University of Iraq in Sulaymaniyah for two years. But my view is that we're, we don't have uh, any business spending blood and treasure in the Middle East trying to build democracy. Many of my students out there believe that constitutional monarchy is the highest political form. We have problems in Asia that we're going to have to face big time. So I think the Republican Party that was blown up was had two parts of it. One was that uh, free markets without concern with the middle class, uh, that, that is no longer going to work. Uh, and the second part is democracy exportation abroad without regard to cost, both to us and to overseas uh, peoples, that's gone too. So I think the new nationalism is very healthy. I think the return to the middle class is very healthy. Uh, And I think the new Republican Party will be built around that. There's still a lot of infighting. There's still people who believe in pure free markets. And even if that means the middle class of America is collateral damage, that's fine with them. That's a problem. I think that's over. So the the Republicans are actually in a rebuild phase. The Democrats think they just didn't go far enough. They just need to keep going down, doubling down on on the identity politics. And Trump is for them the opportunity for every white person to demonstrate that they too are not transgressors, they're innocent victims, they hate Trump, they have to scapegoat Trump. So there's a profound kind of religious need to scapegoat in America right now. And, the, and the, the brilliance of America is that we've had all sorts of peoples come through and they've let down, let behind, let go of their national origins and decide they're going to be Americans and build the world together. And the left doesn't want to do that. They don't want to. They don't want to lose track of their identities. They want to double down on them, and they're not concerned with building a world with their neighbor. They're simply concerned with declaring to their neighbor how pure they are. Well, you can't build a country that way. So well, they will lose again. Well, but he, so here's the thing: you uh, you suggest that uh, conservatives have responded quite poorly to the emergence of identity politics, but. So if, if they've responded quite poorly, how is it that, uh, that you feel the left is overreaching while conservatives are rebuilding the Republican Party? It would seem to me that uh, those two things are in, yeah, in, in, in conflict. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. So I live out on the eastern shore of Maryland, which is a fairly poor place. And I will put it this way. I think the American people as a whole and certainly the flyover country realizes this identity politics is a dead end. The thing that saddens me about the Republican Party is while the base has got its act together, that identity politics is over, the the elites, uh, the Republican Party, the the thinking people who are writing stuff, they're, they are still battling the old demon. So it's, it's Marxism, and, and yes, there's hints of socialism coming out of the left, but the real enemy is not Marxism right now. The real enemy isn't multiculturalism right now. That's 1990s stuff. The real enemy is identity politics, and it frustrates me that they don't, understand what it's up to, that it really is a politics of purity and stain. Marxism isn't a politics of purity and stain, and nor was multiculturalism. So I think we have to see this as a as a profoundly dysfunctional, uh, it's frankly Protestantism in a in a new form. And I mean by that, the what happened to the with the collapse of the mainline churches in America in the 1960s 
was that the category of purity and stain, which is a, a religious category, it's a theological category. Man is broken. Man is sinful. Uh, he is stained, all of us, whether you're white or not. We all have, bear the mark of Adam, so to speak. Uh, what happened was the collapse of the mainline churches didn't mean the end of religion. There's all this talk about how America is now secular. It's not. It's the most religious country in the world. It's just we get our religion, namely our understanding of purity and stain, not in the churches anymore, but out in politics. So my argument is that, 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 the, uh, that what's happened in America right now is we have this religious awakening uh, among the democratic elites. They're concerned with purity and stain. Republican elites don't really get that. They want to treat it as some species of multiculturalism or whatever. We have to see this as a religious movement, as a very bad Christian religious movement. And I think conservatives who talk about religious values, this is the irony, they talk about religious values, they talk about religious liberty, but they don't see that right in front of them is this deeply distorted Christianity that is, on the one hand, as I said, concerned with purity and stain. On the other hand, is concerned with scapegoating. And if you're a Christian, you understand that the divine Son of God is the scapegoat who took upon himself the sins of the world. Well, what we have with identity politics is one particular group, the white heterosexual male, who's the scapegoat who takes upon himself the sins of the world. It's deeply distorted Christianity, and I don't think the, the intellectuals on the right fully understand that yet. There's – there's a lot of talk about this American awakening. There's people out there who are getting hints of it, but I don't think anybody has yet fully nailed it. But I mean, the 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 suggestion you're making is that there's the you know politics as religion, and so the martyrs are now these uh, sort of uh, propagators of identity politics, or their targets, or some combination of the two. Um, so, so how does that play itself out if these of uh, these folks, I mean, uh, a, a good example is, let me see if I can formulate this with an example. Garrison Keillor uh, this week said, essentially, um, I was wrongly accused as uh, sexually uh, harassing anybody, but if it takes uh, my career being destroyed by this false allegation to advance the larger goals of Me Too, then I'm willing to throw myself on the pyre. I mean, that, that sort of a sense of uh, martyrdom isn't that particularly pernicious and misplaced? That's, I mean, you, I guess that's a distorted version of Christianity you're describing. Yeah. So, so what's happened is, you know, if you're, if you're, certainly if you're a white male, and again, please understand me. I'm not saying, you know, we need to defend white men. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying the whole problem is the way we're thinking about this. White men have to show that they're pure. And so woke capitalism, for example, or men who double down on the feminist cause in order to show that they too are – they're not transgressors. They're on the side of the innocents. I mean immense amount of psychic energy today is spent by especially the younger generation of white, white young people, white boys especially, trying to show that they're not transgressors because they right. walk into a room and they're labeled as impure. And so they have to somehow figure out a way to increase their innocence point. So they support green climate new deals. They, they march for the Me Too movement. They're desperate to try to show the world that they're innocent. And this is a kind of sickness. The rule of law took hundreds and hundreds of years to develop. And the presumption in the rule of law is that we start by being innocent and we have to be proven guilty. Identity politics reverses that. So I'm out at Georgetown's campus in Cutter right now. There's a discussion among the students. They're trying to petition the faculty members to sign a petition at the beginning of each class each semester in which they say we won't assault you. So the presumption <laughs> is that <laughs> men are rapists. Yeah. No. Yeah. The presumption yeah. is that men are rapists. Now right. I want to be clear. In my HR documentation, I can get free saunas, I can get free mental health checkups, I get all these things as long as I acknowledge that I'm basically a rapist and I won't rape. I mean, this is the kind of sickness that we're faced with right now. So then, the what, presumption of guilt. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So I, that's that's a clear diagnosis. I get that. And then, so what's the way forward that uh, the the sort of the new Republican Party, the new conservative movement, is supposed to provide? 
Well, I think out in the field, we are, everybody knows that this is just ridiculous. It can't be that we're presumed guilty. So I think that's the, on the ground, people get this. The other piece of this puzzle, which we have not yet talked about, is that the Democratic Party has used black America to do this. So th- there is an obvious wound uh, that we're still suffering from in America. I think the Republicans are in a way wrong by saying, well, we don't have to worry about it. You know, America is this pure country. And Democrats are absolutely wrong by saying America is this irredeemably stained nation. We still have this wound to be healed. My argument is that what happened was that the women's movement, the, 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 the gay and lesbian movement, and more recently the transsexual movement has appropriated the moral mantle of black Americans and said, see, just as civil rights goes to women's rights, that then goes to gay rights, that then goes to transgender rights. And so the whole thing is built upon the legitimate or the wound that we really do have to address. And I think in face-to-face relations, we have to address this. But I think the only ones that can stop this in America are, are, are black Americans. They're the ones who can stand up and say, you know what? Slavery did something that no other group had to go through. Namely, it destroyed families. Full stop. And that means there is a special case here that we have to address in America. And that means helping uh, the least among us, both black and white, to, to, uh, to re-substantiate the, the generative family between a man and a woman. And everyone who comes from poor communities who's dug their way out knows it's the family and the churches that matter. So I frankly think that it's the African-Americans who have the moral authority to say to the Democratic Party, no. Uh, the civil rights movement was one thing. However, it is another thing entirely to have all these other groups, all these other innocent, so-called innocent victims, uh, carry the, the, the moral mantle of the African-American community. So I think the only group that can stop it is black Americans. And they still have the moral authority. I and mean, they had it in the 1960s with Martin Luther King, and they have it now. Very interesting. He is Professor Joshua Mitch- Mitchell, Professor of Political Theory at Georgetown University. And again, I'll tweet out his piece at nationalaffairs.com, which is uh, obviously worth a read. Why conservatives struggle with identity politics. Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Dan. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.proanswer line. Connect with Dan and Amy using the AM560 mobile app.